welcome to error analysis. So this will be my first shot at trying to present uh, subject matter through this medium. So uh, let's give it a shot and see how it goes. Okay, so what we want to talk about in the context of error analysis, this, this is the part of the course where we move off of looking at dynamic systems and we start looking at, um, at, at we actually go back to starting to think of systems as quasi-steady. Um, so so in, in trying to figure out where we are in the course, um, we've basically looked, we're looking at, at things that can go wrong in measurements. So the entire first half of the course is looking at, at dynamics of, of, of sensors and systems and to try to understand, okay, uh, what can go wrong as things slosh around and and take their time to steady out. Um, and then we, we, we finish that section by talking about frequency response. So the idea of what, what can go wrong is, is I have a changing input and how well does my output follow that? How well does my, what does that do to my system? Now, now as we move into uh, the second half of the course, we're going to start to look at, um, at, at, a, at what I think would be talked about as more conventional error analysis. So, so that is, you take a measurement, is it right? Well, we'll as we'll, we'll talk about today, that's a, that is fundamentally a naive question. Uh, and, and, and hopefully we'll get that, get that across today. Okay, so uh, imagine, just for fun, imagine I've got a pipe. Pipe. Fun. And it's got some flow in it. And I put a little hole in here. And just for fun, we say I put a pressure gauge in there. This is a complicated sketch just to make a point. So let's say I read the gauge and I read 53 PSI. The G is for gauge. Um, so if you haven't heard this before, this is an aside. This is not the core of the lecture, but this is worth knowing. Um, when you hear uh, pressures reported, right, there's PSI A and PSI G. Uh, this is absolute. And this is gauge. Uh, there are other spellings of this. I'm using the simple one that doesn't have a U in it. Um, so, because I can never remember where the U goes. Anyway, the absolute pressures are the ones you use in thermodynamics calculations. Gauge pressures uh, are relative, always relative to atmospheric pressure. So, in other words, if you have a gauge uh, a standard pressure gauge and you read it in just sit, sitting in a room, it will read zero. Well, the pressure in this room is not zero. So, so the, the idea is it's relative to, to the room. All right, so anyway, so let's say we t have, a, have a gauge and we read the pressure. So what we know is by, by reading uh, 53 PSIG, we know that the pressure in the pipe is 53 PSI above the, the pressure in the room. Or do we know that? What does that measurement actually tell us? So this, this really irritating question that should lurk in the back of our heads as engineers, okay, you buy a sensor or you buy a gauge, you buy something that measures things. I connect it to my system and it gives me a number. But how much can you really trust that number? The more and the, the more your decisions depend on that number being real, the more skeptical you should be that that number is correct. So, for example, to, to, to try, really try to illustrate what I mean, no gauge, no gauge is perfect. So imagine we repeated this experiment.
with lots of pressure gauges. I mean lots of them. All at the same time, all looking at the same, the same pressure. Many, 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 many pressures, right? So the horrifying thing is that we would get a series of pressures, every one of them a little bit different. If the gauges are well made, they should be pretty close to each other, but they're not all going to be the same. So what does that tell you? That should tell you something about way back up here when we were using just one. Here, we know exactly how much wiggle we've got. In this experiment, which was very expensive, right? We had to buy a lot of gauges to do this experiment. Uh, we, we actually have a pretty darn good idea how much variability there is in our measurement because, well, we, we actually, in addition to measuring pressure, we measured how much variability there is in our, in our gauges. Um, the, here, uh, we have no idea. We're just trusting the gauge, right? So this is much more ideal but this is much more practical. Uh, in real systems where every measurement counts and you have to know how much error you have, what you usually have is something between these where you have redundant sensors. Uh, but there are all sorts of complicated schemes to deal with that. Um, so anyway, uh, th this, this is kind of, so there's a spectrum between whole, oh, just throw a bunch of uh, gauges at it and just put one, at, one in there and trust it. So, so, so there is a spectrum. But in general, we can start to imagine this problem. All right, well, let's, build some, let's build some rigor around this problem. So now, all right, in general, in general, we can imagine that if x were a measured quantity, so imagine x is something that I get back from a sensor, or it could be a yardstick, it could be anything, right? So, but, but x is the measurement that I write down on the page. It's the number I report for that measurement, all right? We can imagine that there is then some, so, some actual measurement. So here's the measured. And this is actual. And the difference between them, we will call the error. So the idea is that there, there's some error that what, what I measure will deviate from the actual by some, by some error. Now, this seems like a simple enough notion. It, it should exactly match with what you've seen in physics and chemistry when you do experiments and you report uh, experimental error. But here's the, the problem that I really want to get across today. If you, if you learn nothing else from this conversation, what I really hope you walk away with is this is never known. You never know the right answer. If you know the right answer, then what's the point of the measurement? In, in real life, in real practical applications, this is made of pure make-believe. You, you don't actually know what this is. You only ever estimate it. We do our best to figure out what this is. This we get straight from our sensors, but we do our best to just sort of reduce this as much as we can so we can estimate this as, as much as well as we can. But you never, ever, ever nail it. If you're like I am, the first time you really wrap your head around that idea, it's truly horrifying. That Take a really simple example, right? Ima imagine just trying to measure my height. That's me. So you go get a tape measure. And you come up with a number. I'm about five foot six. There, done, right? That is my height. 
is it? Well, where did you measure from? Did you measure from the ground to the top of my head? Where's the top of my head? It's a round surface. It depends on how, if you're, if you're getting down to the 16th of an inch, let's be clear, a 16th of an inch is about 63 thousandths of an inch. If you're trying to get down to the six, to a 16th of an inch, which is the smallest gray, um, the smallest mark on most tape measures, uh, your, yeah, that, that, that measurement changes entirely based on my posture, the how I hold my head, uh, are you measuring to the top of my hair versus just versus the, the, the apex of the curvature of my head? I mean, where, yeah, so if I have a bad hair day or something, you might get a completely different answer. Uh, how am I holding my feet? Where, you know, how, how thick are my shoes? How well did you actually curve the... All, there are all sorts of, of opportunities for error here, and we'll start classifying them. We're going to talk about those. But if I lined up every student in the class and asked you all to independently measure my height, every single one of you would come up with a slightly different answer. There would be a cloud of answers, right? And how wide that cloud is tells, tells you a lot about, uh, about how well we, we how, how good we are at measuring measuring height. Now, even if you were, I mean, robotically perfect at using this tape measure, let's say you all gave exactly the same answer, would I still trust it? No, absolutely not, because it, I, I would trust it to within a certain range, but if you wanted to get down to how many atoms tall am I, a, a tape measure is quite simply incapable of measuring that. You cannot do that. So, so there's always a limit. The, the measurement device itself has fundamental limits that prevent it from being able to measure these things perfectly. So when you measure a height, something so simple as how long is a piece of two by is a two by four, right? That is only ever an approximate. And so you have, as engineers, that's not good enough. It's not good enough to say, uh, I, I'm I'm five foot six. I'm five, we need to say how confident we are at five foot at, that I'm five foot six. So in other words, we would need to say that I'm this is a much nicer way to say it. So we would need to say something like, for example, I'm five foot six inches plus or minus. Uh, oh, let's let's say about thirty thousandths. That's pretty good. That would be amazing. No, uh, no, no, no. Let's say plus or minus a sixteenth. There we go. So this this would be an example of a a well stated measurement, right? So this 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 plus or minus includes all of our sources of uncertainty, all of the things that we don't know how little we trust the tape measure, how little we trust the operator, how, how little we trust every element of that measurement. We bottle that up with a, with, and, we, and we include that in an, an uncertainty. Now this looks a lot like a tolerance on a, on a, machine, di on a machine drawing. And, and the idea is similar, but as we're gonna see as we start developing this, this idea actually is, is a little more complicated, or it can be a little more complicated. Uh, and we're saying that, well, the real value x sub a, I don't know where it is, but I'm pretty confident that it's somewhere inside of, of, that, of that zone. Okay, so in order to make sense of this, we, in order to start developing some rigor around this, we actually need some new notation. So, if I, again, I'm gonna go back and look at a measurement x. Now, there are lots of things we can do to x. Now, what I'm going to do is redevelop some of what you know is statistics, right? So, so, so that you already you've already seen some of this in a different context, but I'm going to be using a different notation. So, for example, let's invent this. We're not inventing it; it, it exists. This is called the expected value. And it is equal to the 
you might recognize this as an average. So, in other words, in, in many cases, the expected value isn't something you can actually measure. So let's go back to this case right here. So we, we set up a scenario where we were actually able to perform a whole lot of measurements in measurements of pressure, for example. And so we could actually construct an expected value by averaging all of those pressures. So basically what we're saying is from this experiment, we could construct what we would expect this experiment to give us. We expect the average. We won't get, will, will we get it though? The answer is no, you'll never get exactly the average. And by the way, is the average exactly the actual? Well, we'll deal with that later. The answer is no, not, e not even that is perfect. Um, so, but the expected value is basically based on the best knowledge we have, based on all the measurements we can produce at this, uh, under these conditions. If we repeat the measurement over and over and over and over again, on average, here's what we get. So this is a pretty decent sort of first pass measurement of what, the, what measurement you would report if you wanted to say, well, no, really, I don't want to know every single, pr just tell me the pressure in the pipe, what is it? This is, this is probably what you would report, probably. Uh, so anyway, so there's the expected value. So that's, you know, that's interesting enough, um, but we need to go a little deeper than that. So there are other things that we will want to look at. For example, let's say we wanted to measure how much variability there is in a measurement. So let's say we wanted to measure how much a measurement wiggled around so for example, we can, we, th this doesn't measure that at all. So for example, let's say I had two measurements and both of them were five. Well then the expected, uh, the expected value would be precisely five, right? Well, I, I, I could have also have two measurements. Um, one could be three and one could be seven. And the expected value would still be five. The, the expected value would be completely unchanged. But I think you'll agree with me, those are two very different scenarios, right? If you have two operators and both come to you and they say, hey, the answer is five, whereas if I have two operators and, they, and one says the answer is three and the other one says the answer is seven, <laughs> I am much more confident in one of those situations than I am in the other, right? So this number does not represent that. So we need to, we need to wrap our head around that. So it does not does not represent variability in the measurement. So what we're eventually going to call this, so variability, we're going to start calling this uncertainty. Basically how, how confident, how confident or uncertain are we uh, in, the, in the measurement. All right, so what we can do, and, and, and here's why, but, and, and the average, by definition, kind of rejects variability. Um, but you might be able to smell where this is headed is if we start taking the square of things, right? So, uh, for example, imagine that. So this uh, is just the expected value of the square of x, right? And so, for example, so it's easy enough just to write this. You get the idea, right? We can do all sorts of stuff. And now, now we actually sum up all of the squares of x. And you'll notice you cannot write the expected value of x squared in terms of the expected value of x. You can't just substitute them in. So this is a really important conclusion.
put a box around that. You cannot, cannot, cannot just move a square outside of an expected value symbol. It doesn't work that way for the same reason that I can't move this square outside of the summation. No, you've got to square each and every each and every individual term that's being summed up here. Yep, so you cannot do that. Now here's what you can do. This is handy. So if I wanted to look at the expected value of x, let's say, well we just said that the expected value, that x is this x sub a plus e, right? So here's the, here's the actual showing up again, and here's the error. Well, what is that? That's the average of x sub a plus the error of each measurement. Now, x sub a, we're, we're presuming x sub a doesn't change with every measurement. So that's, there we go, divided by n. So this one doesn't change. So the idea is we're repeating a measurement over and over and over again where the actual value is the same every time. And the error is going to be different with every time every time we repeat it, right? So this is just a constant, whereas this is who knows what this is. Uh, and then, yeah, we just sort of take the average of all of those. Neat. Uh, and all of this is inside. So, so x of a isn't changing every time. And, and, and keep in mind, so this is the number of measurements, if, if that wasn't clear. Let me make sure that's clear. So in here is the number of measurements. All right, there we go. So how great is that? All right, so in other words, well, but look what I can do here. Because of the rules of summations, Yeah, I can do that. So in other words, even though I can't, uh, if I have something like a square or a square root or something nonlinear inside of the um, inside of the expected value bracket, I can't move that outside. But I can split up addition. Look at this. The expected value of xa plus e is just the expected value of xa plus the expected value of e. Not so bad. That's actually pretty helpful. In fact, we can even go one better. So let's rewrite that. Expected value of x. But xa is a constant. That's like me asking you what's the expected value of 2. Well, that's a pretty stupid question. <laughs> it has an obvious answer. The expected value of a constant is just the constant. Uh, the expected value of 2 is 2. If I ask 2, hey, what's your value, I expect it to answer 2. So I, it's a number I don't expect it to answer at all, but you get my point. So, and, and the math bears me out on that. So if you, if, you, if you just look quickly at what I wrote here for the expected value of xa, if xa is a constant, that's going to be, right, xa plus xa plus xa dot 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 n times divided by n. Yeah, that works. The expected value of a constant is the constant. Absolutely, we can do that. So in other words, the expected value for a measurement 
is equal to the actual value plus the expected value for the error, which is not exactly a mind-bending idea. But we've just used this idea. We just used this idea uh, to develop some important rules. So what are the rules that we just, I mean, while developing this idea, we also developed some important rules for expected values. We figured out that uh, when we write the expected value and they've got something nonlinear inside, we can't take it out. So square roots, logarithm, signs, whatever, weird, weird function, any kind of a weird function in there, powers, anything. You can't just move that across the expected value boundaries. But you can do that for addition. Uh, and we've, we've done that to allow us to construct this idea. All right, so now we need to organize errors into types now. And it's gonna be much, very much based on what is this quantity here? What is the expected value of my error? What do I expect my error to be? Well, you can basically split, um, and, and this is, it, error is usually divided into two classes. Um, this is and this is this is a convention um, for, for just how to think about error. So there's random error. Random error and systematic error. Uh, so the idea is with random error, you, you with every measurement you're going to get a result and there is no predicting. What it, what it will be. That is supposed to be an R. With system error, with systematic error, no, the, the error With systematic error, the error is consistent or at least patterned so that it is predictable. So random, you can get the idea where we're headed here is going to obey the rules of statistics, whereas with systematic error, you've got a consistent error that's showing, up, or at least patterned, right? Um, that isn't, that's not governed by the laws of statistics. In fact, this, this may obey any law. Who knows? It depends on the source of error. So this is actually a pretty deep rabbit hole. It seems like the thing we can't predict would be the harder thing to model. In reality, well, statistics, not that hard. Yeah, this is actually not that hard. This is actually, I would argue, the, the more complicated rabbit hole. Um, all right, so let, let's talk a little bit about some physical examples, just, just quickly. So um, with systematic error, um, the, an example of systematic error, let's go back to the, the tape measure example. So measuring my height. Well, when you measure a person's height, oh, the camera's kind of freaking out there, sorry. All right. When you measure a person's height, uh, that, that light balance is not, not helpful. All right, when you measure a person's height, all you have to do, right, is read a tape measure. And in the background, presumably, is some objective that you're trying to figure out the height of. <laughs> Great, there's my cartoon. So if I take this same view, but I put it in profile, so let's, let's, let's look at it from the side view. Here's the person whose height I'm trying to measure. Here's the tape measure. And here's here's the here's my eye trying to read the tape measure. Well, it would seem that the correct way to read the tape measure would be right here, for example. Uh, but I'm short, I might be shorter than the person I'm trying to read, right? So my eye might be down here. 
in which case there would be an apparent error due solely to that perspective, change in perspective. This is called parallax error. That's only one example of error. You can actually have this when you read a gauge. Have you ever noticed if you try to read a gauge, you can tilt the gauge or stand or stand up or stand you know stand stand low, and based on the angle that you look at the at the needle, you can change the uh, the apparent uh, angle uh, to the meter. Yeah. So this is um, this is called parallax error. Uh, and there are gauges that are actually designed to prevent it, uh, but this is just an, just an example of a systematic error. If I am, I'm going to be the same. If I measured the entire class's height this way, and I was measuring it every single time, this type of parallax would be systematic, right? I would make a similar error, or at least a patterned error, based on my height, the differential between my height and your height. I would make this error every time, right? So this would be an example of systematic error. On the other hand, if we conducted the experiment such that um, the person, the, the operator who's doing the measuring, that that person's height is not controlled for it. So that person's height is random. Uh, so we, let's, let's say the other way around. What if I have the entire class measure my height so that my height is consistent, but now the person doing the measuring now that height is random. Now, now we're over here. The measurements, we would expect the measurements to vary randomly with, with, with random error. So, so this is a really simple example that actually lets us get our teeth into how these, how these ideas are, are separated. OK, I'm going to split this lecture into two parts. I'm going to continue, so please please pick, pick us up in uh, error analysis two. And hopefully I can get this, uh, this auto, auto white balance thing sorted out. All right, thanks for watching.